The following is a presentation of the Belly Up Sports Media Network. We're hearing news now that the whole blindside Michael Orr movie and the whole story was all a lie. Is it true? Is it false? We're going to talk about that. And also we're going to talk about some teams in the NCAA and college football this year. Talk about how we feel like they might be able to be able to fare out this upcoming season. Yeah, we've dived into some of these teams in depth already, but we want to kind of dive into them a little bit more, talk about it, because college football is right around the season, guys, or right around the corner, sorry. Uh, and, of course, we got to do our two-minute drill, and we're going to talk about fantasy football draft strategy. Uh, I need to pick these guys' brains to figure out how we're going to do a fantasy football draft because uh, we are going to be represented in the belly up the belly up fantasy football. So uh, we're going to have to talk a little bit of strategy and all that kind of stuff today here on Rising to the Occasion. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Rising to the Occasion. We're very excited to have you back. We had a little bit of a break because Jeremy and I were away. We went out to Canton, Ohio, to the Pro Football Hall of Fame for a big old weekend for a fantasy football expo. Got to meet up with some of the other guys from Belly Up, so that was a lot of fun being able to finally meet them face-to-face because we're all over the country now, and so we don't usually get to do that, so that was fun. And also being able to play a little bit of flag football, meeting Des Bryant, all kinds of stuff. It was a fun, fun weekend, but... Uh, we're back, and we're back with some more content to bring to you guys throughout the week. But before we get started, I do want to just remind everybody, because we're, we're growing, but we want to keep on growing. We want you guys to become supporters and followers, so you can hit that subscribe button. That's a very quick way. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. If you're on Apple Podcast, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts, you can hit a hit that follow button or whatever it is on there. Uh, and of course, always give us, giving us a five-star review helps us out greatly. But if you want to help out and support us a little bit further, we're reminding everybody that we do have a Patreon now where you be, you can become a true member, a true supporter of Rising to the Occasion, and you're going to get a little bit of extra content as well as uh, even the higher package being some free merch that we're going to send you, and we'll make sure to throw all kinds of new extra stuff over there. So that way, for those who are supporting us directly through that that uh, avenue, we're able to kind of give you guys a little bit extra, and it's just a great way for you guys to help us out and help us keep on growing and help us to keep on doing stuff like what Jeremy and I were able to do this past weekend. So uh, it's, it's, it's been a lot of fun. It's been great to see all of the growth that we have been getting. Uh, it's confusing at times. We were just talking about that before recording here today, uh, how confusing it can be. But uh, it's, it's definitely showing in the numbers that we're growing, and we thank you guys all so much for all that you have done. So like I said, an easy and free way to do it real quick is if you're watching on YouTube, just jump down there real quick and hit that subscribe button. Hit that like button too because that helps us out a lot. And of course, you can always tune in and, and sit here and uh, go down in the comments. We'd love to see your guys' con- comments. Uh, I, I go through and try to read every single comment that we get. So make sure to drop a comment as well uh, today. I mean, if you don't know what to comment, answer this for me because we're going to talk about Michael Orr and the news coming out about that. How do you think this case is going to pan out with Michael Orr and this whole blind side and the Tui family? Uh, how do you think that's all going to pan out? Because we want to hear from you guys. But I'm going to go ahead and bring in my two co-hosts, first starting off with a man from Mobile, Alabama. Blake, how you doing? What is up, fellas? Uh, Just two weeks away from college football. It is finally here. Uh, Some preseason football going on. Uh, You know, it's it's in the air, fellas, and and you can you can smell it. I mean, it's it's right there. So, uh, you know, a lot of stuff to talk about. This Michael Orr stuff uh, just kind of sounds crazy to me. Yeah. Um, why now? You know, uh, th- that, I guess that's what I have to say about it uh, is why now? Like why all of a sudden is it now? So, uh, yeah. but we'll get into that, man. We'll get into that. Um, guys, I- I'm just ready. I'm excited for where this podcast is going and all of the big uh, college football and pro football that, that we are going to be able to create content about and everything. Uh, I'm excited for the direction we're headed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Jeremy, uh, we had a fun weekend, but uh, you know, we had a little bit of a day of recovery today. Had to take the day off, and uh, just got back in just really just a few hours ago. But how how you feeling after the long weekend? 
Um, I can definitely tell you one thing's for sure. I'm really tired of tall booths. Um, <laughs> that, that made the trip seem a lot longer, but overall the trip was way over my expectations. I couldn't have had a, any better of a time. Just like I mentioned before, again, to go to the state of Ohio, again, to see the hall of fame. That was one thing on my bucket list that I got to check off. I never thought I'd check it off this soon, seeing all the buffs and seeing everything that you could think of for going into the hall of fame. It was truly unbelievable. Then recovering from a little bit of turf burn. Obviously I know you are as well, Josh, you got a nice shiner on top of your noggin. Yep, so um, making sure where the hat. Yeah. The day, but. Yeah, exactly. You got one on your head. I got one on my left leg. That's uh, feels pretty good. I I really do not remember miss, missing turf burn this bad, but um, yeah, I'm ready to get into it. Uh, I know we got a lot of stuff to cover today, but let's kick it. Yeah, for for those who don't know, uh, we're we're gonna have some content dropped. Hopefully, we can get that footage from the flag football game. That's why we didn't ask anybody to try to record because we didn't have anybody extra to sit there and record the game for us. So I was like, yeah. ah, they got media people here. We can grab it from them. So hopefully they get back to us. They haven't yet, but hopefully they get back to us and they're able to send that over to us. It was a lot of fun. We were able to play yeah. on the same field as Des Bryant and all that stuff. So, uh, yeah, a, a super cool experience throughout the whole weekend. But uh, it, it definitely brought up a lot a lot of ideas, too, where we can try to get all three of us together, go go to some of these, these types of expos, too, because, like, I'm not huge on fantasy football. I like it. But uh, th- that's the thing that was so cool about this is I was expecting it to be all fantasy football and that was it just a bunch of drafts and that's it uh and not too much Same. outside of that but we we took a little tour around and everything we've got footage i was already going through the footage to try today trying to trim everything together and put piece it together so we're, we'll have plenty of content for you guys coming up very soon on all of that but let's jump into it guys michael Orr comes out and and like you said blake i i, I agree with you it, it's it's not that the idea of what's happening uh it just sounds so you know it's so extraordinary that it couldn't be true it's just the fact that man like this this movie came out what was that like 2008 2009 something like that when this came out and yeah a long time ago yeah and and you're just now coming out and saying something about it i don't i don't i i have a hard time believing it i'm not saying i don't believe it I, i i also think that we should hold true to the you're innocent until proven guilty so i think the tui family should be able to talk about what what what's actually going on from their perspective and everything but michael Orr, he comes out that if for those who don't know who michael Orr is or maybe you're too young to remember the the movie the blind side uh, michael Orr was an offensive lineman in the league for many years and he got there uh, and a huge part and a huge thanks to the tui family uh who both of them uh, this, this family took him in and uh, from the movie's perspective they they adopted him, brought him in, and made made him their son, and you know helped him a lot. And he was really good at football, and so they helped him succeed and and propelled him in, into the NFL really. And so uh, it, it's a cool story, but but is it true? Uh, now now that's something that we're having to ask, and it's it's crazy. If any of this stuff is true, that's it, it sucks for Michael. But at the same time, like I I just feel like there's a lot of this without looking into it and and being able to know the facts uh just kind of seems crazy but some of the 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 uh actual details about it i had to pull up the the article i was reading about it today on uh so so michael Orr he he came and made this uh kind of uh appeal to the to the court trying to tell the the court that uh, in tennessee that uh he was not adopted by the tui family that they actually only had him sign papers for a conservative conservatorship which you know ultimately i this is the question i have for you guys i don't really understand what difference that makes in the whole scheme of things um other than maybe that there's they're just he's trying to say that they never really wanted him to be a true part of the family or something maybe um but for those who don't know if you're if you're uh kind of under this conservatorship it's more or less that the biological mother still has the the ability to kind of come back in your life and become your mother again and, and take you back um, where adoption is that's not the case so I mean uh, Jeremy I mean all of this is kind of coming out now uh, and I guess some some more of of the details on this too is that there's a, a contract price of 225,000 in addition to 2.5 percent of the film's proceeds which the film grossed over 300 million dollars uh, and then there's also a two hundred thousand dollar donation to uh, Leanne Tui's charitable foundation too. So I mean, all these 
all this stuff it's saying that basically Michael Orr didn't see a penny of this money. Uh, I don't know if that's all true, and, and I don't know what all is coming out uh, about this. But, I mean, if, if this stuff is true, I mean, what are we thinking about this whole situation? This is, like Blake said earlier, this has been so long ago. Why do you bring it up now? Overall, this is gr- growing up as a young kid, that was my absolute favorite sports movie, if not my top one. Like, hearing the story of Michael Orr and what everything that he had to go through in his lifetime, that's truly a, a tough life to go through, of course. Obviously, being the way he was growing up in a really, really tough neighborhood and community, and finding his family, obviously the Tui family, then bringing him into it, and becoming who he is now, then coming up, coming out of it, I don't know exactly what to and what not to believe. Just because, like you mentioned, Josh, you don't believe anything until it's proven. Just because we could all be making this stuff up, or we can really just be completely mind-boggled about this entire situation. And overall, I'm when I first heard about the the story come up, I was really, I was really shocked. I had to read it twice because I thought I was reading it wrong. And then once I actually got the chance to click on it and read a tiny bit about it, I was really skeptical and just short for words about the entire thing but overall my my ability of it i don't know how much to believe like i said just because nothing's proven until proven guilty but i i'm kind of i'm still lost for words about this entire situation just because becoming into that movie and just watching the entire story and just what he went through and everything overall I I could never imagine living a life like that than being able to be blessed like he was to have a family like that and bring him under his wing and then trade him to a right way then becoming the person who he is but I really I'm really a short short for words at this entire situation about it overall yeah yeah and ultimately like you said too I mean both of us were pretty young uh, I mean uh, Blake how, how old you how old would you have been back in 2009 uh, I was a senior in high school, man. Okay, yeah. So you weren't throwing butter the me. bus. I think like I was that. like in middle school. So I mean, you were you were a little older and everything. But uh, ultimately, no. Yeah, I mean, I, I think looking at this, I mean, I I remember whenever this came out, it was definitely up there, one of the coolest sports movies, and just seeing seeing the opportunity that he was given to, and and the fact that the family just kind of they they seemed like you know like I know I know what this looks like, but we're just trying to give you a better home. And that's kind of what the whole story was about. And it was a cool story. Uh, and even seeing some of the flashbacks that they put in there of Michael Orr's actual draft day and everything and how they were so proud of him. And, and I, I don't know, it's just, it's Blake. It's, it's hard to believe because like what we mentioned, it's, it's just been so long. Why did you wait this long? Yeah. Uh, look, yeah. Wow. It come out in 2009. That That's insane. Yeah. Huh? So I I graduated May 23rd of 2009 from high school and started college uh, in in August of of uh, of 2009. So, uh, so yeah, man, bringing back a a crap ton of memories right there. But yeah. okay. so here's my thing with this story is is am I saying that Michael Ward's a liar? No. Am I am I saying that the Tui family is lying. No, I'm not. I'm just asking a big question of why now. All right. You have had all of your playing days. All right. All of this time since 2009, when this film was made 14 years ago, for you to come out and say, hey, look, I, I really wasn't adopted. All right. So something has had to go down in the family for him to get mad and come out and say, hey, look, I wasn't adopted. All right, It's like something had to happen between them and their relationship. Something had to go sour because I was just watching SJ on Barstool a while ago, and he said that there was text from like 2020, 2021, where he said, now this is all coming from SJ, so there's three sides to every story. All right, his side, Michael's side, and the truth, okay? But this is just from SJ. He said, there was text messages from Michael saying, if you don't give me this, I'm going to go public about it. So, obviously, he was saying, like, hey, if you don't give me this amount of money, I'm going to go public 
to the courts and the media that I really wasn't adopted. So something's had to happen. And then Portnoy went on to ask, SJ was like, well, like, what is your relationship now? And he was like, ah, you know, I still love the guy. He was like, but I'm mad at him. And he was like, but you can love somebody and still be mad at them, right? And Portnoy was like, yeah, sure, absolutely. And he was like, I don't know. He was like, Mike stopped really, like, you know, coming around the family or having much to do with the family when he retired from the NFL. So super weird to me that all of a sudden now you want to bring it up and now the Tui family is getting bashed. Okay, the one thing I do agree with is the dude made zero money off the movie. That's BS, all right? Like that that's that's crazy to me that even SJ said that his dad handed him a check on Barstool a while ago, his dad handed him a check like 10 years after the movie had been made and it was like worth, I think he said like $17,000 or something like that. And he was like, yo, he was like, what is this? And he was like, oh, he's like, that's for the movie, The Blind Side. And he was like, that movie was made like 10 years ago. And he was like, yeah, but we still, we still get like a reimbursement check from it from, for just, you know, uh, basically it drawing its pennies, you know, every time it, it goes on cable and somebody watches it, you know, it racks up payments. And so he was like, okay, you know, that's awesome. And he was like, then a couple months later, he would get a check for like $8,000 and it would be like, here you go. Like, here's another check. And then he said a couple months later, it'd be a $5,000 check. So, uh, for Mike not to get any of that, like, yeah, that's that's crazy. That's wild to me. Like, it's it's wrong. Yeah, um, and I guess a lot of it too is if he didn't get money, because that's that's the other thing too is like, yeah, I, I just don't know if that's true. If that's the case, maybe they found another way to kind of pay pay Mike's side out differently. I don't know what the what the true story yeah. is. Yeah, and and that's what's. I think there's a lot of things that we have to. Uh, follow and hear on this whole thing before I just basically like crack down on it. But that's my biggest question is, is why now, why are you bringing this up now? Because, you know, I'm, I'm always going to go back to when, when I'm in my family, all right, when I'm in my family and somebody gets into an argument, then all of a sudden somebody wants to start throwing a jab, right? All right, when you get into an argument in your family, somebody wants to retaliate with a jab and they want to throw uh, something from your past all right, out into the public. What, what do your family members do when you get into an argument, bro? They go straight to Facebook or Twitter and they say, oh, watch this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull something from his past or her past and I'm going to put it on Facebook for the world to see. All right. It happens. People do that. Like, it's just a lot of red flags and all of this. Like I I look at the Tui family and I can see what you were seeing too. Like, don't get me wrong. You were seeing a cat that was a five-star offensive lineman. He was a five-star left tackle and you were seeing dollar signs. All right. How all this went down. You were seeing dollar signs when you picked him up. Let's not get that twisted either. This ain't all about Mike, right? Uh, You, you, you saw a, you saw an African-American kid, who was really good at football and you knew he was getting college interest on the division one level. And you said, Hey, like I want to help him out, but you also saw an opportunity too. So uh, like, and, and, and that's where all of this comes from is, is you didn't want to adopt him because you wanted to make money off his name. So you wanted his brand deals, all right, and and all of all of the Tui family businesses and all of those things. So you technically didn't want him in your family, but you wanted to make money off his name, image, and likeness. So uh, there's a lot of stuff to really dig down, man, and, and hear the truth about all this. I, I want to hear more about it. I'm going to be following it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's something that I want to follow too, just because, like, like we said, it's it was an iconic film. Uh, you know, just looking at it definitely. and what the story was, who it was about, and it was it was big too. So I mean, uh, this this might be the next one that they 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 cancel. They they push this this movie, maybe completely pull it off platforms. I don't know what the case is, but if, if that is tr- the truth that he didn't get a penny from any of this, I mean, that's that's a lot of money uh, t- to be talking about too that that he didn't get. So I mean, that's it's crazy. And Josh, one thing, and and Jeremy, guys, like, 
I've heard an interview before a couple years ago where they interviewed Mike and they said, Hey man, like what did you not like about the movie? And he was like, well, they portrayed in the movie that I didn't know how to play football. And he was like, that was a lie. All right. Well, in that same interview, why didn't you come out and say, well, the Tui family also didn't uh, really adopt me. Like that, that, that would have been the perfect opportunity to have been like, Hey, they really didn't adopt me. Now, yeah. I've also read another article mm-hmm. saying that he just found out like seven months ago. So if that's true, then there's this whole other story of the Tuies really held this from this dude for all of this time. That's wild to me, bro. If they really did that, that is wild. That is yeah. insane if they held yeah. all of that. From- because what what what? I'm, I, what I read about it too is that like he so like what you said he didn't really know about all of this until recently and, and apparently whenever he signed the papers and everything that he was he was in agreement to all of this of them you know he thought them adopting him and then now to be his conservators you know it, it wasn't the same uh, you know and so I, I I again I don't I don't know a whole lot about what the difference was because the dude was almost eighteen anyways and so you know, what, what difference does that truly make? Whether, whether you're actually adopted or not, I guess, I guess from the outside's perspective, maybe you're not a true part of the family. Maybe you don't really have a part of the family money, you know, and stuff like that, that they have, cause they were wealthy. Uh, and that was, that was a big part of the whole story and everything too. But yeah, it, all of this is crazy. It, it seems just kind of way out there to me. And, and even if there was, this was, cause like you said, I think that when I, the, what I was reading was that he found out about this a few months ago. Uh, and so I don't know if maybe this, these months have gone past where he's just, Hey, you, you guys need to make this right and come out about this. Or if something happened where he said, no, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm angry with the family now. And, and, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm going to come out about this public and kind of ruin you guys. I don't know what the case was, but definitely a situation to kind of keep tuned in. But, uh, yeah, cause I mean, all, all of this kind of seems crazy to me that, that all yeah. of this is coming out. And, and again, just being, yeah. what is this now? 14 years later. And now we're finding out about, man, that this movie that we all loved isn't even, it isn't even really based on a true story anymore. Uh, it yeah, was pretty exactly. much all a lie. So there's it, so it's, many it's times crazy. you could have put your foot in the door, but now you just, all of a sudden, not even put your foot in the door, just make a big conspiracy about no, it. You so. just you just whipped that door open like Dwight Schrute, man. Like, cause you know you you want to catch people in the act, but uh, yeah, it was it was pretty crazy. But to to see all this and, and the headlines is what kind of threw me off too. And even my dad was texting me like, yeah. "Man, did you see this?" Uh, and yeah, it was it's it's insane. But guys, let's jump yeah. over. I know we're talking a little bit about Michael Orr, an NFL player, but let's talk about college football because we all know that's where it's truly at right in the college football game, checking out the, the college football teams and who's going to be coming back. Um, I, I should pull up real quick. I didn't have this ready to go, but uh, I'll pull up the AP poll for – I actually got it for you, Josh. Oh, do you have it pulled up? All right, let, read, off, yeah. read off that top 25 there for me uh, just so we can right. see these teams that are, that are popping in here, Jeremy. All right, re- starting off number one, we got Georgia. Number two, Michigan. Number three, Ohio State. Number four, Alabama. Number five, LSU. Number six, USC. Number seven, Penn State. Number eight, Florida State. Number nine, Clemson. At 10, we got Washington. Number 11, at Texas. Number 12, with Tennessee. Number 13, with Notre Dame. Number 14, is Utah. Number 15, is Oregon. All right, we can Number stop 16, right there at 15 State. for the most part. Because we're, we're pretty much All good right. right there through the top 15. After that, I don't really care too much. I think a lot of it – I mean, I, I'll, I'll be straight up honest with you guys. Oklahoma went 6-7 and seven last year. Why are they in the top 20? That doesn't make sense to me. Um, you know, and, Well, and you don't like number Texas, 25? Texas, Texas A&M didn't even make a bowl game last year. Why are they in the top 25? Um, so, I mean, there, there's a lot to this. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah, Iowa, 25. If we were talking about that, Jeremy, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's insane to me. Yeah. But let, let's start off. Out of with all number, teams you could have picked, you picked Iowa. <laughs> let's start off with number one through four. In, any Anything you guys would change with number one through four? You got Georgia, Michigan, Ohio State, and Alabama? No. <laughs> Blake, are you frozen on us? I think he might be. <laughs> that or he's just holding in a sneeze. I don't really care. I don't really know. But Yeah, I, th- I think Blake's um, frozen on us. We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll, <laughs> but maybe maybe this this uh, top four shocked him so much. But we'll we'll kick him out real quick and yeah. and have him jump back in yeah. here in a second. 
But yeah, so I mean, exactly. looking through. Oh, there he is. He's ringing back in again. Hey. Yep. Oh, maybe. I don't know. Drum roll, please. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep on trying. But... Yeah, we'll keep on trying. But to answer your question, Josh, for the top four, I, no, I wouldn't change a single thing. I mean, obviously, you got the four powerhouse teams at the top. Obviously, what what Georgia has done the last year, then same with Michigan, then Ohio State, obviously. All these this top four teams, you can literally just say, look at all these teams. I mean, how, what more can you really say about these top four? They're all – of course dominant teams always have their name in something whether it's the championship or even obviously bowl contention but overall with this top four you really can't do much with it in my honest opinion yeah yeah and i was looking at the top four i think looking at that overall uh yeah i i I like the the top four because the top four just seemed seemed to to make sense to me but let's let's see this real real quick yeah it's still not showing (laughs) <laughs> Blake's Blake's completely out on us. Well, what but in the we'll heck? Jump over just the two of us again. Yep. Yeah, he's showing completely out of it on here on us. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know, but while we're while we're fighting here with the uh, with the technology and trying to get everything running in here, he he, he keeps on trying to ring in. We'll, let's see if one of these times he finally gets through here, but. There he is. I thought right. technology was supposed to be better. Yeah, we got we got Blake in here again. I don't hey, know I here he is. There we go. There we go. I'm back. Right. Blake, did you have anything wrong with that top four? Georgia, Michigan, Ohio State, Alabama. Nah, I'm cool with it. You know, I, I'm cool I'm it. not. I'm not. I'm not like stressing preseason rankings, man. No, no. I'm, yeah, no, I'm, I'm one think... of those people that you wait and yeah. and drop them. Yeah, yeah, I think I think we even talked about this a little bit last season. Like, I, I'm I'm more for it. Just wait until towards the end of the season. Wait until like what what is there? Thirteen weeks total in, in college football now. Uh, so you can wait till week eight to drop actual rankings. And that, that, I mean, I don't know how much rankings really help you, other than the fact that you have something out in front of you to kind of base it all on. So I, I I'm not I'm not against having rankings throughout the season. You know, but for me, it's like week six is like the earliest. I think you can really drop true rankings, but it, it is kind of yeah. out there. Uh, another one that kind of surprised me a little bit was Penn State being all the way up at number seven. But looking at who's below them, I wasn't too mad about it. Uh, I, I think that that fits all right. Um, but looking at what the rankings are supposed to be about, uh, I I do kind of feel like maybe Florida State and Clemson being at eight and nine maybe should be above them there but uh it was just a little shocking to see some of the the rankings like i said i think the ones top 10 i was pretty pretty happy with overall even top 15 can't argue with it too much but it was whenever you start to drop down below the top 15 to kind of see some of these teams that that jumped in there uh and i'm sure a lot of it is just hype a lot of it is just kind of looking at what they're able to do this upcoming season that's kind of how they do a lot of these but yeah yeah but uh Looking looking Iowa. through these teams and everything and kind of seeing what we've got before us. I know we've talked about a lot of these teams in depth already, but I want to kind of dive into them again and just kind of talk about retaining or, or declining. Uh, so it, whether you're going to retain success or decline and maybe start to, to you know, maybe just plateau, however the case may be, maybe you start to backslide. Uh, and I want to start off with USC because I, I know we talked about USC. We just talked about them this past weekend. I think I think a lot of people have been talking about USC a lot. But the expectations are very high for him. I know that none of our expectations are very high for USC, mainly because of that defense, and I think everyone would probably agree with that. But looking at USC and looking at what they've got for this season, uh, and, and not just this season, but seeing what they can build this season to to propel themselves into the seasons uh, to come after this 2023-2024 season, uh, Blake, we'll start off with you. Looking at USC, do you think USC has got what it takes to be able to retain the success that they've had? Uh, you know, and and really that just this past season, because you take a season before that, I think they only won uh, four games. But do you think they have what it takes to be able to retain that success? Uh, they do, but like we always talk, like I'm not going to sit here and trust an Alex Grinch defense. I'm just not going to do it. And and Lincoln Riley has showed to us and proven to us that. Uh, he he likes to score sixty, but he likes to give up eighty. So 
you know, you, you just showed us in your New Year's Six Bowl uh, against Tulane, and, and you got beat by a group of five team, and don't give me the lazy excuse of I didn't want to be there. That's crap. Uh, I, look, I think the Pac-12 is going to be uh, strong. I think, it, I think it has the chance to be the second toughest conference. Oh, did we lose you again? I think so. But to answer his question, I think he was going to talk about them being the second toughest. Well, maybe. Uh, I can, I can, uh, you know, I can hear you now. Am, am, did there I? We go. Me? Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, you, look, you're gonna have you're gonna have uh, you're gonna have Washington, Oregon, uh, you know, Utah that that won it last year. They beat USC twice. Uh, you know, you're gonna have. Uh, who, who else is over there? Uh, Oregon State. I have them. They're going to be tough. Uh, so it's just going to be a loaded conference, man. And uh, I'm just not sure if they can – I'm not sure if they can make that run this year. Yeah, yeah, I like that. And, and I, I think I think this year is going to be tough for them. I think it's just going to be one of the, t- the deepest seasons they've had out there in the Pac-12. We talked about that. Um, but, but Jeremy, do you think USC has what it takes going forward to kind of retain that success? And, and like I said, maybe not even just this season alone, but do you think Lincoln Riley has what it takes to kind of keep that, that historic program afloat and keep them, you know, kind of, do you, do you think they're just going to be sitting there treading water or do you think they can sit there and kind of propel? Well, I mean, looking at Lincoln Riley for what he's bringing to the table, he they can definitely become a team to reckon with. Of course, like they already are on one side of the ball, but you look on the other side of the ball, it's obviously a completely different situation. I I sincerely do think that they can stride, but you got like we've mentioned before, you got to play on both sides of the ball. I don't know what I don't know how many times we can really repeat ourselves about that. But looking at USC, obviously, I know they have a unbelievable offense that you'll they'll run down your throat. Then they'll they'll make you look silly to say the least, but I mean, obviously looking on the defensive side, I'm not even going to get into that category because I think between all three of us, we can probably write a novel about their defense and how lovely they are. Um, I really do want to see them succeed, but you got to be consistent on both sides of the ball and just not favor on one side. Yeah, yeah, and let's remember Jeremy is rooting for them to hit the under. Uh, 25 points a game on defense so that's that's what he's trying to shoot for this oh, year yeah. uh, we'll, we'll have to see if they're able to hit that but guys i forgot to throw in real quick and make Fingers sure we crossed. mention our sponsors <laughs> got to mention our sponsors over at big frig huge thanks to them for joining the team kind of helping us out and supporting us here at rising to the occasion big frig is the place to go to be able to get your coolers and tumblers uh, big frig has all of the um, most amazing uh, products when it comes to these these coolers and these tumblers uh, they, they sent us a huge package with all kinds of stuff and just to try it out and we, we absolutely love it all it's a very rugged cooler it's a cooler that you can take with you whether you're going camping or you know going fa- going out fishing uh, you know whatever the case may be if you're going out tailgating which guess what guys it's coming up we're here we're, we're at tailgating season you need some great products you need a great cooler to take with you when you go out tailgating Big Frig is the way to go. It's going to keep everything that you need cold. Uh, it's going to keep it cold. And so it, it's the the best cooler on the market, uh, hands down. It's something that you don't want to miss out on. You can go to BigFrig.com and check out how cool their coolers look. Uh, I know how, how confusing that sounds, but uh, just because of how cool coolers are. But I, I, I truly mean that, though. Go check them out at BigFrig.com, B-I-G-F-R-I-G. Dot com and you can use code rising two twenty. That's R I S I N G T O two zero for twenty percent off if you go over there and use that code at checkout. Uh, they have been phenomenal for us so far. Uh, like I said, being able to hook us up and uh, and just kind of having this this partnership with them. So guys, go check them out. Bigfrig.com and use code rising two twenty for twenty percent off. The best place to get your tailgating cooler and tumblers, all that kind of stuff. But uh, moving on down through our list, guys, we we look through, and uh, I guess Florida State's another one. I know we, we talked about Florida State. I know we have high expectations for Florida State this year, but uh, e- even if they, they, they do go, let's say they, they win the national championship this year. Let's say they go all out. Do you think Florida State has what it takes to retain that success uh, going in even past this year? Uh, Blake, I guess I'll start off with you again. Yeah, absolutely. Uh 
the way they're recruiting right now, Mike Norville has absolutely flipped the script, turned the scene around down there in Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, and yeah, I think that I think they have the potential to, uh, you know, full steam ahead and and just um, keep keep things rolling down there. Look, this is a a historical dominant program over the years that Bobby Bowden. Uh, built up and and made a made an empire out of right like uh, many a years that they were at the top of the game fighting for a national championship or to play for a national championship right there at the end of the year so I can remember uh, you know in 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 my lifetime when I was a young kid uh, you guys are uh, you know a couple years too young to probably remember this but uh, when I was a, a, a young gun, uh, I, I remember sitting in the floor with my dad watching college football, and there was a guy named Peter Wark uh, that played at Florida State. Uh, I didn't get to ch- I, I didn't get to catch the Dion days, but uh, I did get to check the uh, the Peter Wark uh, days out, and those were fun. And and Peter Wark was one of the most electrifying college football players that I have ever seen in my lifetime, uh, and and I was just a young pup back then so uh, th- this is a program that that can stay on the rails and and uh, they can compete at a high level for many years to come yeah yeah and I like that too kind of looking back at the history I think that says a lot about a, a program and that's I think that's why you still have such high mm-hmm. hopes for some some teams uh, and, and looking at Florida State I think that just the historic the, the history behind that program uh, Jeremy with you I'm gonna I'm gonna jump down to Washington we look over at Washington they had a good season last year a big part of that being their offense, but they have defensive guys, and we, we've talked about them. Uh, so looking over at Washington, do you think Washington's another one of those teams that can retain this success or uh, also kind of throwing in the, the, the for the factors that they're going to be moving over to the Big Ten as well now? Um, but do you think Washington's one of those teams that can kind of retain that success? I think so. Obviously, I know, as you mentioned, having both offensively and defensively, being able to keep that stability and keep it going up. I definitely think it's going to be strong for them looking into the season. Like, obviously, I I wouldn't necessarily say that they're going to win the the championship. But I mean, obviously, I know having returning players is also a big key role in that position. And once you get those key position players, them showing the young expectation guys who think they're going to come in and just knock your socks off first game. All of a sudden they line up against a lineman that will terrify the absolute crap out of you. Um, and, t- and then that leadership, they'll obviously calm them down, get them settled, then guide them off in the right direction. That'll definitely help them. But looking at this team, I, I don't know exactly how many returns that they have, but I know they'll definitely have enough that they will show the young people the right to the wrong ways and looking at it, it it'll be a good season for them in my honest opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Looking over at Washington, I think they've got what it takes because we, even backing up, I mean, Washington is not really a, a huge historical program. You know, we talk about USC and Florida state and jump to Washington. It doesn't have the same history there. Uh, you know, they, they don't yeah. really have a whole lot, but whenever you look at Washington in the past, They've always had kind of that 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 team that'll give you fits just about any time you schedule them in the in the uh, you know the out of conference schedule you know looking at at uh, you know the the teams outside of your conference and playing them Washington was one of them that would definitely give you fits I can remember uh, Nebraska playing Washington a few times and seeing what they were able to put together so I think yeah. with with seeing what they've got right now too and and uh, you know with uh, we, we obviously can look over at Michael Penix Jr. and seeing what he can do. But if if they're able to kind of keep that success without some of these key star star players and everything, and again, we're in a day now, in a day and age where you have the transfer portal to be able to lean on, and I think Washington is one of those one of those locations that you can definitely draw kids in to to a place like Washington, and it's it's one of those places that, especially with the success that they've had here, really looking at last year and seeing what we kind of expect for them this upcoming season. Uh, yeah, I totally agree with you with, with kind of looking at Washington, what they might be able to do. But now looking over at Texas, uh, I guess kind of kind of looking at Texas is, I, I don't think there really is much. I, I kind of put them on the on the wrong list here. But is is Texas one of them? I guess maybe I'll, I'll kind of jump ahead and just say, are, is this the year that Texas bounces back, uh, Blake? This is the year, man. It's got to be the year. This is uh... – 
you got everything right in front of you. You get to make a trip to Bryant Denny Stadium. Uh, you got all of the pieces coming back on both sides of the ball. Your offense should be absolutely electric. Hopefully, Quinn Ewers can stay healthy. Uh, this has got to be the year. This is the this is the Sark money year. That's what I'm going to call it. Uh, this is where you have to show you have to show out for the boosters, the you know the you know those board of trustees, the fan base out there. Because Texas isn't going to put up with losing, man. They're not going to put up with losing to Kansas and all that stuff. I, Texas wants to play for for a Big 12 championship to go out their last year. They want to come to the SEC and be competitive and, you know, fight for a, a, a spot in that SEC championship. You know, they, they, they have big, big plans uh, for that program over there. And uh, losing to Kansas and stuff and Baylor and all that, like, that's not part of it. So this is the money year. And you get by Alabama in week two, and I think the, I think the, uh, the smoke starts heating up. I think that uh, you're going you're gonna to start catching a lot more media attention. And, and uh, you know, obviously anything can happen in that, in, you know, that little, that little rivalry they play out there at the Texas State Fair and all that. But, uh, um, you know, anything can happen there, but you, you got to win 10 games. I think you got to win. <sighs> it, it's tough too. I, I know, I know where you're sitting there with it because like, yeah, you, yeah, you want to win 10, but I mean, even, even 10 doesn't feel like it's good enough when you, when you're coming over and you're, you're not going to be playing that same big to- big 12 schedule anymore. That's what I'm saying, man. Mm-hmm. It's like, I, I, I think if they win 10, I think everybody's happy. If, I think even if they went nine and three, I think everybody would be happy. Um, yeah. But I think it would also be a little letdown because they're sitting there going, "Hey, we're projected to be the top dog in the Big Twelve. Now we got to go take it." Um, but it would be painful for somebody like Baylor or TCU again to come out of nowhere and snatch it from you, uh, or uh, Texas Tech. I know we said they were a dark horse. Uh, but yeah, man, I think this has got to be the year for Texas. Like, you, the Sark's got to make something pop over there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I I, I feel you because that's kind of where I am with Oklahoma too. And I've said that before, where you know I, I feel like ten wins is is doable and it's something you got to be happy with because you just now only you only won six games last year. So mm-hmm. jumping up to a ten win, you can't be upset with ten wins. You can't be upset with being able to reach that double digit mark. But just knowing the battlefield that you're walking into. You, you want to go in holding your head up high with 11 or 12 wins if you can. Yeah. Uh, so I feel like that's kind of the same for Oklahoma and Texas both. But looking over at Tulane, Willie Fritz has done a really good job with Tulane. And uh, th- this is a team that looking at them, you can take a look at, at Tulane a few seasons back and you know if just really historically, again, talking about historic programs, Tulane's not one of them. <laughs> you know, yeah. fighting over there in the AAC and and seeing what they can do over there, it, what what we saw from them, really the last two seasons was was a team that's willing to fight. Uh, I forget mm-hmm. forget the kid uh, Pratt that they got there at, at quarterback. He's mm-hmm. he's he is a workhorse. He's talented. Uh, he's, he's very tough, yeah. very talented. Uh, I saw him almost almost give Oklahoma a loss a couple of seasons ago. Saw him give a, a tough Kansas State team a loss last season everyone kind of gave k-state all kinds of crap for losing that game and then coming up coming to find out at the end of the season Tulane's still hanging around and Tulane's looking pretty good all of a sudden k-state's not looking too bad for that loss and then jumping forward into that bowl game uh, again i don't I, I'm, I'm with you blake i don't want to hear these these excuses about yeah but we didn't want to be there no Tulane walked in and handed it to usc they ran the ball physical they ran it right down their throat, and and it was something that USC couldn't stop. Uh, so I, it wasn't anything to do with they didn't want to be there because they still put up forty some points. Uh, in, instead, they just didn't want to stop Tulane from putting up, a, a, you know, a, a, an extra point above them. <laughs> so they, yeah, they just exactly. couldn't step in there and and have the defense to stop them. That's really what it boils down to. So uh, Tulane's one of those teams. I think with Willie Fritz, what he's been able to do down there. I, I expect Tulane to be the next team to jump out of that group of five conferences and start to jump up in whatever it's called now, I guess the group of four or the, the power four. 
uh, wh- whatever we, we call the rest of these conferences. That Where would they go? Where would they go? I, I think I think the Big 12 wants teams like that. Big 12. I think that's kind of what they're going after. The Big 12 is just kind of be, going to be that 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 conference that has all these teams, kind of kind of what the Big 12's really been for a long time, really since since the earlier 2000s, you know, before 2010, I feel like whenever you still had Colorado and Nebraska and Missouri in there, they were still defensive teams. They were still tough teams, and they were they were the top, you know, one of the top dogs. I don't think there really was a conference that was so much, you know, head and shoulders above another the way that we see it nowadays. Uh, you know, where now it's really between the SEC and the Big Ten, and it has been since probably 2010. Um, but ultimately, the SEC still kind of kind of holds their their head just just over the rest of the conferences. But I think the Big Twelve is going to be that that conference that just kind of holds on to teams like Tulane and UCF and all, all these other other teams that are kind of staying in there too, just to see you know, hey, we've we can compete at a national level, just not all the time. You know, and I think that's just kind of going to going to be the the way that that conference is going to stick around to to be. I think they're. I think they're in good hands. I think they're doing the right thing to keep their conference together. I just don't think that the conference is going to be one of these top dog conferences to really to really uh, be reckoned with, I guess. Yeah. But looking yeah, over at Tulane, definitely. I got I got a lot of a lot of uh, appreciation and a lot of respect for Willie Fritz, and especially what he's done down there with with Tulane, and uh, he he's got that that uh, that way of going down there. But jumping over to Kansas, Blake. Uh, we, we've got Kansas, the Kansas Jayhawks put together a pretty good season last year for them. Uh, you know, maybe not, not something that Auburn or Oklahoma or Texas, anything like that would want to see, but a very good season. They started off six and no, looked pretty strong, even going against a, a pretty good Arkansas team, put up a really good fight against them in the, in the bowl game. Uh, do you think what Lance Leipold has over there at Kansas is something that he's going to be able to, to kind of retain and be able to kind of keep that success going over at Kansas? No. <laughs> Bas- <laughs> Basketball school. Sorry. Um, look, they did this back in like the late, uh, I think it was like like 2007 or something like that, like 2008, 2009. Yeah. One of those years in there, they like played an Orange Bowl and everything like that. Like they had a magical season and all that stuff. Uh, it can happen, but it's not going to be sustained success. All right, like you're not going to just uh, repeatedly at Kansas go, you know, nine and three or ten and two or whatever. You're a basketball school. Bill Self runs the operations out there, uh, and and that's just how it's going to be, you know. And and uh, Stone Cold used to say, and that's the bottom line because Stone Cold said so. <laughs> uh, and, and Bill Self says, hey, that's the bottom line because Bill Self says so. Okay. <laughs> this is a basketball school. It'll always be a basketball school. It's always been a basketball school. So as far as, as uh, what what Leopold has done there, uh, it, he's done a great job. He's done a great job. It, it's It's been uh, awesome watching the talent that he's been able to bring in there, uh, the success they've had. Uh, really fun, uh, really fun offense to watch. Uh, defense just flies around, attacks the football. It's been fun, but for me to sit here and say that this is going to be a, a program that ends up going nine and three or ten and two, and and they continue that success and build it into something special, uh, I'd be sitting here lying to you. So that's yeah, just where yeah. I'm. At. Yeah, and ultimately looking at at teams like this, whenever they build up the success, it's a small team that doesn't really have a whole lot to, to, to offer when it comes to talent or even just bringing talent in who wants to go to little Lawrence, Kansas and, and go play football. Uh, and, and it's, it's not really an, an attractive spot for guys that are in college football. And it, like you said, I think, I think looking at what Leipold did there at Kansas, I think that the problem that you run into with teams like this is that you're going to get Leipold putting together a couple of good seasons. And who knows? He, I, I think he could have another, another decent season with, doing a lot with nothing again this year where you see kind of that national attention again come to Lance Leipold. But mm-hmm. the problem with it is that it only lasts so long for a small coach in a small, small area like that. Uh, yeah. And then they end up getting uh, drawn out. But uh, Jeremy, let's, let's kick over to you with Cincinnati. No, it's not your Cincinnati Bengals. It's the Cincinnati Bearcats. We saw what Luke Fickle was able to do with them and bring them up. And, and it wasn't just a one-year fluke. It wasn't just a two-year fluke. That He had them at a consistent level competing at a, at a, 
a, maybe not a high level, but a very good level, and then transitioning it to a high level because we saw what they did to Alabama. Everyone, everyone said that they didn't deserve to be there in the, the college football playoffs at all, and then they go against Alabama and put up a very good fight against a great tied team. So with Cincinnati, looking at Cincinnati, they don't have Luke Fickle anymore. Uh, you know, and, and a lot of their their starters, it's going to be a rebuild, but now they're in the Big 12. They have more resources. They have more money to kind of put into the program. Is Cincinnati one of these teams that, that can utilize this conference realignment to become, uh, you know, a, a better team and kind of retain some of that success? I sincerely think so. Obviously, I know, like you mentioned, losing Luke Fickle, it's definitely going to be a a reevaluation and stepping stone. You're definitely going to obviously take one step at a time here, then just keep keep building that key up and just keep trying to fight for and claw for what you can. But obviously, from the time that he was there, of course, like you mentioned, becoming in Alabama, them being pretty much considered as Mr. Irrelevant that they shouldn't even be there. That was unbelievable. Yeah, they sh- they completely shocked probably the entire state of Alabama for what that they brought. Obviously, I know the outcome didn't be the outcome that they wanted, but, I mean, looking at them, they really shocked the heck out of everybody. Um, I I still sincerely think that they can they can bring it up again. Is it going to be like what they have been the last couple of years? two to three years i don't necessarily think so i i can see i can see cincinnati maybe going seven and five or even maybe like eight and four i'll be i'll be pretty generous with them but overall i i like the cincinnati team and i'm not being biased just because i'm a Bengals fan also being from the same state of ohio but i mean these guys they can they can definitely put in some work and then they can just keep that stepping stone rolling and they can find their way yeah, yeah, we'll have to see what uh, Scott Satterfield can do over there. Um, I mean, I've, we've we've yeah. seen what what he's done in the past. I don't have a whole lot of faith in what he can do there at Cincinnati to start off with. Um, but fingers I, crossed. I, I like, I, yeah, I, I like your optimism with them though. Looking over at Cincinnati, and, and like I said, I think adding those resources, adding everything that they have that the Big 12's able and willing to 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 offer them, I think that can definitely help them with that rebuild. It's going to be tough because, like I said. You didn't just lose your head coach in Luke Fickle. He took a lot of guys with him too, and you know it's it's yeah. it, it's tough to to sit here and tell those guys like man like why what, you know you you shouldn't have left that school, but you did go to play with, for Luke Fickle, and I think that's I think that's one of the few scenarios where I can I can totally kind of lean back and say yeah that's I'm I'm okay with guys transferring for that reason. There's there's a few reasons to transfer that I don't like, uh, you know just like I'm not getting playing time, and I think I'm I'm worth more than that. I don't always like that that mentality, um, just because I think yeah. that's kind of a, you know, you 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 need to work and grind and, and get yourself to that point. But I think that's one of the cases. But guys, I'm gonna go through a list of of other other uh, teams too, and I want to know if you guys think they're gonna have a bounce back season or if they have plateaued. Uh, just a quick bounce back or plateau. So uh, starting off with Illinois, Jeremy, do you think this is a bounce back season for? Illinois that they start to bounce back and have some some bigger seasons or do you think they're pretty much plateaued at that at that seven or eight win season I'm kind of plateauing out of man out of honestly like Illinois a coin flip you can have like you said seven and five eight and three or you're or you're lucky to win five games at the most but I'm plateauing it Blake plateau yeah plateau. I like it yeah, I figured I knew I knew what the answer was going to be for that one. Uh, it just it kind of seems like Brett Bielema has pretty much got them at about their peak, uh, especially with what they've got there. But now jumping over to Wisconsin, we talked about Luke Fickle jumping over here to Wisconsin. Now he brings in Tanner Mordecai. He's also got Nick Evers in the a, a young guy trying to build him up. Uh, where do you see this one bounce back or plateau, Blake? Bouncing back, baby. The, the Badgers. Usain, Usain Bolt and everything. <laughs> yes, right. Oh. The Badgers. The Badgers are back, all right? Camp Randall, <laughs> jump around. They're going crazy up there uh, up there in Wisconsin. Uh, have a day. Hopefully they don't move the Big Ten championship game to Las Vegas. That would be a disaster. Keep it right there in good old Indianapolis, right? Uh, and, and let the Badgers make their way over there to Indy to play either Michigan or or Ohio State, or maybe even Penn State. How about that? How about that? I like that. Uh, Jeremy, plateau or bounce back? What do you think I'm probably going to say? I'm joining the trend here. We're definitely. 
you'd be correct then. <laughs> I'd be correct that they're, they're going to plateau. They're just done. No, I'm just messing with you. <laughs> they're definitely going to be having a high point. I'm not no, going to have Blake it. come at me and be mad at me. No, yeah, see, I, I, would I, I know. I know you guys well enough that I figured I knew, I knew your answers, but this is one that I'm kind of curious on because we've talked about them a little bit, but I don't think I've gotten a good read from you guys. Jeremy, Michigan State had a very bad season when you look at what they had. I know uh, Kenneth Walker brought them a lot of success a couple of years ago, but Jeremy, do you think this is a bounce back season for Mel Tucker with his giant contract that he's got up there at Michigan State? Do you think this is a bounce back season for him or are they pretty much plateaued now? You might as well just sit and eat some popcorn because they're done. <laughs> they're done. Okay. I like it. So you're, you're thinking yeah, either they done. need to move on from Mel Tucker or, or they're done, huh? How you feeling, Blake? Yeah. They uh, they signed a guy to a contract that, uh, that he hadn't given enough. He hadn't done enough. He hadn't showed enough. And now they're in trouble because the buyout is yage, right? Uh, and uh, – <laughs> I just don't see them winning a lot of games. And can you pay that buyout and fire him, or are you stuck? I mean, you're – You're stuck. Yeah, you're (laughs) stuck. You're stuck, and you're not going to pay that buyout, and you're going to – I don't know if you win two games or whatever. You might win four or five, but if you want to call that a bounce-back season, but I'm going to call it plateauing, so – uh, yeah, uh, Tom Izzo, hopefully you can get to the Elite Eight soon or whatever for basketball season because you're a basketball school there in East Lansing. Uh, you always will be. Stick to it, all right? <laughs> hey, like hey, it. Jeremy. Uh, um, Jeremy and Josh, let me let me ask you guys something. One, one weird thing about Michigan State real quick is why did they name their football facility after Tom Izzo? Yeah, I don't know. I, I never, I never really. I always wonder that. that same thing. So, Mark D'Antonio, who is the all-time winningest coach in Michigan State football history, took them to a college football playoff appearance, <laughs> and you name yeah. your football training facility, locker room, whatever you want to call it, the Izzo Center. So what? Michigan State. Why? A basketball school. Oh, absolutely. All right. Well, they're done for then. See you later, Michigan State. No, I mean, I, I, I like your guys' answers. I think your guys' answers are probably more logical. I'm going to go with the other side, but I think Mel Tucker is a good coach. Mm-hmm. I, I think he had a bad year, uh, and, and I think their defense was just not on top of the last year. I think I think this is going to be a bounce back from last season, but I do think they're going to build back up on this. I think you're pretty much stuck with Mel Tucker right now. So. That's why I, I think they're going to stick with him, even if he has another just kind of mediocre season this year. Getting to a bowl game is kind of your goal right now after what you had last year. So I, I do think this year they have a bounce back season, I guess is what you would call it. Uh, looking, yeah. looking a little bit better. And I do think the season after that, they start to look better. They look like the Michigan State of the early you know 2010s and stuff like that. So I'm going to jump over on the other side of it and say that this is a bounce back season for Michigan State even though that's not really what we should be calling a bounce back season for a big 10 school, but let's jump over to Nebraska. Blake, we've got Matt rule coming over to Nebraska. Is this a bounce back or is Nebraska just stuck in a rut? Another Bouncing back. Hey. Nebraska. Nebraska. Welcome back to college football, baby. <laughs> I, I, I am on the corn, all right? I'm on the bandwagon. I'm riding the train. Nebraska, welcome back. Give me a nice little uh, eight-win season right here. Uh, Give me eight and four, seven and five, and let's talk about 2024. I'm on the bounce back train. I think Matt Rule has a year. He gets the people uh, out there in old Nebraska, out in the Midwest, and he gets them really – Fired up, so uh, yeah. Kudos like to that it. fan base for hanging around, man. Uh, some of the best out there. I like it. I love it a lot. Uh, we're we're gonna save the other ones, but uh, for for another time, I guess. Jeremy, real quick, I gotta get yours on Nebraska. Is this a bounce back? Is Matt Rule the guy? It's it's time, baby. Let's time. let's get the Nebraska train rolling here. Let's go. All righty. Just because yeah, I, like I know, obvious. Obviously, with what Nebraska's been through, they got to go somewhere, and this is their time. They got to bounce back, and the time is now, as John Cena would say. Blake Corum, little 
celebration in the end zone, chewing on the cream <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> I exactly. loved it. I mean, I know Nebraska fans hated it when he did that, but I yeah. loved it. It was a great, great celebration. But I'm going to save the, yeah. other, uh, the other teams that we've got on the list. Now, I've actually got a few more teams to add to it, too, um, just because I want to jump over to the two-minute drill. We're going to do this real quick. Uh, Jeremy, take it away with the two-minute drill, man. All right. First on the list, after 1,032 career NHL games and 16 full seasons, Boston Bruins' David Krejci has finally announced his retirement. Then, Josh, I know obviously you and I have been around the hockey community for a long time. We've watched David Krejci play with the Boston Bruins for forever in his career. Then winning a Stanley Cup. I don't remember exactly how many Stanley Cups he's won, but um, – after 1,032 games, would you say your buy is ready to finally give it up? Yeah, yeah. I mean, looking over at David Krejci, I mean, it was it was kind of shocking news because we just talked about how, uh, who was it? It was Bergeron that just retired, right? Yep. Bergy. Yeah, so, so we, we just we just saw, yeah, Patrice Bergeron, he just now retired. Uh, and then now you hit, you have uh, David Krejci. So, I mean, th- this is a huge blow uh, for, for the Boston Blue, Bruins. And looking at his career, he's had uh, over 1,000 thousand career games like you said and he's scored 231 goals 555 assists uh, i mean just an outstanding career and and definitely a legend of the game uh it, it sucks to see him leave but uh good luck boston you're gonna have a little bit of rebuilding to do yeah exactly then i was actually gonna ask you that question blake i know obviously as josh mentioned losing their captain patrice bergeron and now losing another big key piece as david Krejci. what do you think boston's season is going to be looking like this upcoming season do you think they're going to still be the same or do you think they're going to be down the slumps for a little bit nah they'll be fine man then no need to panic for now they'll be fine they'll uh, they'll still be right there in the in the thick of things in the East, and uh, no need to worry if you're a Boston fan, Jeremy. Everything's going to be all right. I tell I tell all of my Auburn people to just take a deep breath. Uh, the the organization is in good hands, brother. Don't yeah, worry. Absolutely. Be happy. Don't worry. Then go on to the next topic. I know. Um, when I saw the news, I couldn't pass this up. Henry Ruggs announced the sentence on Wednesday that he, he's going to be spending three to 10 years in prison for the failed DUI crash in November. And after three years, he is eligible for parole. Now, Blake, I know obviously what Henry Ruggs has done is was in the past and what he has done. He's it's flat out what happened. I know you can't turn the past back and change what he's done, but do you think this is the proper sentence for punishment? And do you think he should be able to be eligible for parole? It must be nice to have money in this country, brother. Uh, Yeah. Three to 10 years for killing someone. Um, I don't know, man. Like, I (laughs) insane dude like uh you took a 12 was she 22 years old yeah i think so yeah, 22, very young, early 20s uh yeah and and it's not like she had she it's not like she died on impact or anything rose like she had to sit there and burn to death and suffer and and also took her dog with her like um yeah, it, it must be nice to be a millionaire and and play professional football in the united states of america right um because I, I look, I voice my opinion on drinking and driving. All right, uh, mistakes happen, but drinking and driving is not a mistake, in my opinion. I'm sorry if you disagree with that. I'm sorry, like it's not. Uh, it is a choice. You you know what state of mind you're in, and uh, I just don't think that three to ten years is enough for that decision that was made. The man was arguing with his girlfriend. He knew what was going on. He knew that he was doing 157 miles an hour. Let's be honest here, okay? Let, let's cut the BS and, and all of that stuff. Like like three years for taking somebody who was 22 years old. Insanity. That That is and, – and you get a chance to get out of prison after three years – I, I can't get down. Look, this has nothing to this has nothing to do with me being an Auburn fan and my hatred for Alabama. Nothing to do nothing to do with it. He was a star here in the state of Alabama in high school. 
He was a star. All right, he went to the University of Alabama. Nick Saban said he never gave us any problems here in Tuscaloosa, but he went out to Vegas and he that one night changed his life. All right, do not drink and drive, man. But when it comes down to it, in this country, we see over and over and over again, if you have money, you can buy yourself out of punishment. And it's BS. It's, it's crap, all right? It's, it's, everybody wants to talk about, oh, well, this person has privilege and this person has privilege. Well, Henry Ruggs has privilege, all right, because he's rich. If that was me, you, Jeremy, or you, Josh, we would have gotten a way worse sentence than three to ten. Okay. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I have, I, I probably shouldn't be saying this on air, maybe, but uh, I, I have a family member who served life uh, for for something very similar, uh, and and it's yeah, it's, I, I agree with you, man. It's it's ridiculous, to kind of look at this and I just realize that man, like this this guy took somebody's life, and there's there's not any kind of there's not really any kind of consequence for him. He just goes and serves a little bit of time. You know, for what was it, three to ten years? So even at the max of yep. ten years, that that doesn't seem right to me. I mean, uh, I'm pretty sure he's if, 37 if I, when he gets out. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, he's still got a lot of life to live. Uh, yeah, he's got something on his on his criminal record, but th- that doesn't matter for somebody of of his stature. Uh, yeah, it's 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 sickening, and I'm I'm glad you brought that up, Jeremy, because we didn't we didn't get to touch on that whenever it first hit the the news and everything. Whenever we we, we wanted to get to it, I think we were gonna try to plan to, to talk about that last week. Whenever it came out and everything, didn't get to an episode back then. But I'm glad we were able to touch on it because uh, yeah, I, I think you said it well, Blake. It's 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 sickening to say the least. Yeah, absolutely. And I I couldn't say it any better than you, Blake. Obviously, this it's not a thing. It's definitely your decision. If you do if you do this decision, you're definitely going to pay the consequences. Do not drink and drive, everybody. There's Ubers. There's whatever sort of transportation, depending on where you're at. Literally, please do us all a favor. Don't do it, please. Now, going on to the next topic, going to the golf side, Lucas Glover. Winning his second PGA win, obviously from the Wyndham Championship being the first one, then now coming up to the FedEx St. Jude Championship. I don't necessarily know his exact scores on a scorecard, but Blake, you, all three of us have golfed before. Golf is not the easiest thing to do. Then what do you think was running through his mind when he understood that he has a possibility of winning this thing? Uh, that that he's playing on an elite level right now, uh, and he's playing out of his mind. Uh, it's incredible that that he has gotten this hot and to do what he's done right uh, in consecutive weeks and tournaments and uh, just insanity. Like like I just said about the last one, it, it's crazy, bro. Like like you said, we know how hard golf is. Like uh, I just played Friday and Saturday, and and. Uh, like you can walk up to the tee box on seven and hit a absolute pipe down the middle of the fairway and walk up on eight and shank one into the woods, you know, and, and you're just sitting there going, man, I just had the same swing. Like what changed, you know? And uh, all it is is a small little twerk in the, in the swing. And, and that's, that's how hard the game of golf is. But you know, him uh, and what was going through his mindset was probably a lot of cash and uh, a lot of money and uh 3.6 you know, million dollars yeah and and uh just doing it at that level uh and just blowing it away man kudos to him yeah absolutely josh then i know obviously as you and we were talking about this earlier actually back on the way from ohio there's not that many people that can do this kind of caliber that went back to back but i mean Looking at it, do you have anything to say really about what it really takes to even just step up to the tee box and perform at your overall best? Yeah, I mean, guys, I like like Blake said, I, I love the game of golf. I love going on golfing, but it's so difficult because yeah. you, you do one thing wrong. And like you said, Blake, man, like it's it's just like, what did I do different? I feel like that was the same swing, and then it doesn't go through. But, yeah, for the fact that he was able to go through and win this, and not just win it once, win it twice in a row – uh, I mean that's that's crazy. Yeah. I, I I haven't seen anything about how often this has ever happened, but uh, I, I mean I've I don't recall ever seeing this since following the game of golf. I don't recall ever seeing this happen where where a guy wins it twice in a row. 
Uh, and then he also won it in overtime, too, against Patrick Cantlay. So going against another really tough uh, tough golfer. And then uh, I think Rory was, was right up there. I think they, they went into overtime, I think, with 15 yeah. under. Rory was at 14 under uh, and, and uh, you know, right there on, their, on the heel, too. So, I mean, just the fact that you have th- those two guys right behind you and you were able to, to, to inch inch forward and win that in overtime, uh, what an amazing, amazing win, and to do it twice in a row. Yeah, absolutely. Then only, I just wish they can shed some luck on us, Josh, because I know obviously you and I always go golfing usually once or twice a week. Um, we just wish that we can have some of the luck that they always have. But going into our final topic, after being with the Dallas Cowboys for seven years, Ezekiel Elliott signs a one-year contract with – the New England Patriots worth up six million dollars. Now, Josh, I know obviously the last game for Ezekiel Elliott wasn't the way. Obviously, I know his remains are probably still on the field back wherever they played at. What do you think this is going to do for Ezekiel Elliott and the New England Patriots organization? Yeah, I mean, it kind of makes me, me nervous that maybe you can't take uh, Ramondre Stevenson now in a fantasy draft. So that, that's the only thing that I, th- <laughs> yeah. I think. Yeah. I mean, I just I hope Bill Belichick is smart enough not to play this dude because th- th- this is what I talked about with uh, with Dan Mater this weekend when we were on uh, you know going live from the the fantasy football expo. As I was telling him, I was like, I just don't I don't have any faith in Zeke anymore. So looking over at Zeke, I think it was a good thing for the Cowboys to finally part ways with him. You're not paying him anymore. You're you're done with that. And I looking at what his his, uh, you know, his stats were in the last few seasons. They keep on going down, and I don't know what it is. I think I, personally, I think it's just all this fame and fortune has gone to his head. Um, but I, I think it was a bad move for the Patriots to pick him up. Uh, I, I was kind of hoping just to see this be the end of his career, honestly. Yeah, then Blake, I was actually going to ask you the same question. I know Josh kind of brought it up a little bit. Do you think this is a positive thing or a negative thing for the New England Patriots and them picking up Ezekiel Elliott, and what could it bring to the table? Uh, I I think it was a desperate thing. Uh, I think it was uh, a desperate move to see if this could actually work. I do not think it will work. Uh, I'm with Josh here. I think that uh, Zeke is done. Put a fork in him. Rooting for him. I'm rooting for him. I hope he has a great year. Uh, but I'm just not – I'm not believing it until I see it. I'm not believing in the Patriots. Uh, I just don't think they're going to be very good this year. So, uh, Zeke, kudos to you for getting your one-year deal. Uh, but I just don't think he's got that work ethic in him anymore. So, uh, you know, th- those yeah. Ohio State and early Dallas years, those are long gone. Yeah, absolutely. Then I know me speaking personally, I'm in the same boat with you guys. I I thought the last game for last season with his remains left on the field was going to be the final hurrah for him. But kudos to you, Ezekiel Elliott. Then hopefully you can prove us all wrong. I mean, obviously we hope you have a great season. But Josh, that is all we got for the two minutes roll. What else do we have left on this day of the episode? Did you not? Did you not have the uh, Dalvin Cook signing on there as well? No, I did not, but okay. I can actually bring it up really quick just because yeah. I had to scroll down. The da- Dalvin Cook, obviously, with the former Minnesota Vikings, now signing with the New York Jets, and looks like all the Jets fans got their wish when they saw Dalvin Cook walking through practice, and he is signing a one-year contract deal worth $8.6 million. Now, I know, obviously, for a running back like Dalvin Cook, he's definitely going to bring everything to the table. Blake, I know, do you think he's going to be able to transition it pretty easily over from the Minnesota Vikings to the New York Jets organization? Or do you think it's going to be kind of a little bit of a struggle for him to get his feet growing a little bit, then maybe bring it up towards the back end of the year? Nah, man, Jets just pushed all the chips in. They're all in for a Super Bowl. They're all in. Uh, This move right here, basically, if you don't win a Super Bowl, it's a bust. If you don't play in the Super Bowl. It's a bust. Uh, you know, I'm sorry. That's just how I feel. Like, they're all in now. Like, you've got an elite offense. Your defense is nice. Uh, I don't want to hear any excuses. You know, it's time. The Jets have pushed it all in. And, uh, you know, Dalvin Cook's an elite back. I think he'll be just fine. And uh, now you got a you got a two-headed monster back there. And, and uh, your, your wide receiving core is elite. And, you know, you've got – Aaron Rodgers and 
that that defense is nasty. So uh, yeah, I, I think they pushed all the chips in, and, and they're going for they're going for the big daddy this year. Yeah, absolutely. Then Josh, I know Blake just mentioned a little bit. Obviously, now that they have Aaron Rodgers as quarterback, we're all going to be assuming that he's going to be QB one for the New York Jets organization. What do you think this is going to do, knowing that they have a one-two powerhouse as Aaron Rodgers with QB, then obviously having Dalvin Cook in the backfield? Yeah, well, I mean, one thing I want to talk about is their defense because looking over, I mean, the Jets had a good defense last year, but. I was just watching them and what they were they were able to do in the preseason. And even in the preseason, their defense looks really good. And I think there's like, I don't know, there, there, there's something there's something about them that I'm really excited to see that defense. But now you jump over to the offense. We can always talk about Aaron Rodgers. That was a huge move in the offseason. That was a big part of why their offense wasn't good last year. Really the main reason yeah. is that they didn't have a consistent quarterback there. And, you know, of course, you've got Brees Hall still. And you're now adding Dalvin Cook. You've got Garrett Wilson on the outside. You've got a stud, uh, a, a stud uh, kind of a, a packed offense now, where you've got guys all over the field now. So I think this is a, this is a complete team now. This is something that's it's different. You know, it's different seeing the Jets this way. So I mean, honestly, for everyone else in the league, you you know who the expectations are put on. You know it's on the Jets, and for the for the Jets, you know we have big expectations from you. Uh, I'm I'm right there in with with Blake. I think this is a Super Bowl or bust. I mean, at least make it to the Super Bowl at the very least. I think if you make it there, it's not a complete bust. Being able to be, being able to win a conference championship is a big thing, and being able to be being, being able to get that far, I think is is a a good thing for your team. But if you don't make it to the Super Bowl, it's a, it's at least a bust. But I think you should be expecting a Super Bowl this year with with that kind of a talent on on uh, pretty much all over the field. Yeah, absolutely. Then now is officially the last topic of two minute take. So Josh, yeah, yeah. back over to you. I, I knew you brought that one up to me earlier, so I knew we we had to jump into it and uh, make sure we touched on it real quick. Yeah. But before we get any further, I want to take a moment to talk about something really special, guys, uh, and that is our friends over at Seat Geek. Seat Geek is an amazing way to get your your tickets. So if you're a fan of live events, whether it's sports or music, theater, whatever the case may be, you know how challenging it could be to find the right tickets at the right price. That's where SeatGeek comes in. With a seamless mobile experience, SeatGeek allows you to buy and sell tickets in just two taps. It doesn't get any simpler than this, guys. Uh, so just on top of that, though, it gets better, all right? Because what, what, oh, SeatGeek, what SeatGeek does is it grades every ticket from red to green based on your value and it helps you identify the best seats to fit your budget plus every purchase is fully guaranteed so you don't have to worry about anything being insecure it's completely secure and you can you can go through the entire thing with a complete peace of mind now we love SeatGeek so much that we've teamed up with them to get you an amazing offer you can use our code r2to that's r the number two to and you can use that at checkout, and boom, you'll get $20 off your first ticket purchase. That's right. Just download the SeatGeek app or go to SeatGeek.com, pick out those perfect tickets, and enter the promo code R2TO for an awesome $20 off. SeatGeek, life is an event, and we have your tickets. And now let's get back to it, guys. Uh, we're going to close this out real quick with uh, going through and just kind of talking a real quick fantasy uh, fantasy uh, strategy here real quick for us. So I don't know if we've we've talked too much with you you yet, Blake. I think I don't think you were on the episode when we were going through kind of our, our fantasy football kind of top fives and, and positions and everything. But let's just talk strategy. Uh, we already kind of gave Jeremy and I's top fives and, and positions. I think that'd be different if we were to do it today. Kind of seeing some of these newer moves and everything. I know Dalvin Cook was one of the guys that we really wanted to throw in there. We couldn't. Uh, but even kind of seeing how guys look right now in the preseason, I think that kind of gives you an idea of where to maybe bump them around and stuff. But let's just talk about the strategy alone. So over a belly up uh, for everyone watching, we're going to have a, a uh, network wide fantasy football draft. It's a lot of a lot of the coverage is always going to be over on belly up YouTube page. So make sure to go over and, and subscribe over there as well. Uh, you can check it out over there. We're going to go live with the draft on August 17th, if I remember correctly. Uh, I can pull that up to double yep. check, but uh, we're, we're, we're all going to have a, a big old draft with a bunch of guys, and it's rising to the occasion against pretty much everybody else in, in Belly Up. So, you know, we've got a bunch of different shows kind of jumping in, and we're all kind of jumping in as, as a team. So I wanted to kind of pick your guys' uh, brains a little bit 
uh, and just double checking this uh, August 27th. I don't know why I, I thought 17th. I guess I got got that mixed up. So you can tune in on August 27th at 10 a.m. Central Time, and we're going to have that live draft over there. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Where it's going to be over on the Billy Up YouTube page, so you can check it out and watch the draft there. But guys, the, there's a lot of different strategies to a fantasy football draft. Uh, Blake, I know you and I talked quite a bit about uh, fantasy football last season. Jeremy, you you said you're, you have never really been too big into it, but let's talk a little bit of a strategy here because we're, we're trying to piece together a team that we're, we can we can be the best guys at Billy Up. You know, we can we can be the top dogs around here. And uh, so. Yeah. Where where you you see all these strategies kind of fall in line is what what position do you do you think is going to be the most uh, valuable to your team and then you also have to think about what positions uh, are, are going to be running out. Uh, it's a fourteen team league, so that kind of gives us a little bit of an idea. But Blake, starting off with you for your number one pick going into that first round, uh, I think we have the the eighth pick overall. Uh, w- with your rounds, how do you like to usually break it up? Uh, I guess one, it kind of gives us all kind of a strategy, but then it also maybe giving a little bit of uh, advice for other fantasy football lovers as well. Uh, where do you like to usually go with that first pick in that first round? A back that can catch the ball out of the backfield and is electrifying in space, like a Christian McCaffrey or, you know, even like a Dalvin Cook, you know, yeah. uh, you know just somebody like that. Uh, that can uh, get the ball in space, make guys miss, and and take take one to the house. So an Alvin Kamara, you know, like uh, any th- I like taking a back that can catch it out of the backfield, and he's gonna get his yards uh, in between the tackles and on the ground. So that is my first pick, and then like my second pick, uh, I usually I'll either follow it up with a if there's a top running back available, or I'll try to go like top receiver. Um, I, you know, it just, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be like a big name. I, I look at people who catch a lot of balls, all right, or, or who get, get a lot of targets, you know, uh, it always doesn't have to be a big name. Um, but that, that's the way I, I do my, I, I go quarterback late. I go quarterback late. Like I'll ride with a I'll ride with Lamar Jackson at quarterback. Like that's fine with me. I, I don't need a big – I don't need – I'm not going Pat Mahomes' number one overall pick. It's just not happening. So, um, and then I kind of sneak in I, – I, I, look, I'll tell you this. I like to sneak in my defense a, around like the sixth or seventh round, just kind of where like people are still focusing on um, – you know, skill guys and everything like that, and you snag one of the top defenses in the league. Go out, make a bold pick, and grab a defense, uh, and get don't don't get stuck with one of the worst defenses in the league because defense and fantasy matters. Everybody's like, oh, you just want to get ten points. Nah, man, you want to get you want to get your twenty, you know, twenty two, twenty four points out of your defense um, because you know it it, it matters uh, at the end of the day. So. Uh, you know, I, I I stick late towards kick drafting a kicker. Um, you know, but just because I, I look, I'll drop a kicker and add another one on the waiver wire in a heartbeat. I, yeah, yeah. Kicker. I feel like it's it's pretty easy to usually find another kicker out there too. Yeah. Like you, you might be able to get like maybe an an Evan Evan McPherson or Justin uh, yeah. Justin Tucker or something like that, uh, or PJ Tucker. Right? Am, am I saying the right name? Is it Justin? Uh, ju- yeah, you had Justin yeah. Tucker. Okay, I was right. Justin who's, Tucker who's was PJ? right. Who's PJ Tucker? Why, why, why does that name right? Basketball player. Okay, yeah, that's right, that's right. All right, I'm like, man, why, why do I got two names popping up in my head? Uh, it's been a long day, guys. It's been a long weekend. Um, I'm, I'm still drained and yeah. tired. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I like that too, just being able to hold off. And, and Dan and I were even talking about this a lot too. Like, man, you can even wait and not even draft a picker because that or yeah. a, a kicker at all because then you can sit there and pick and choose from the guys that you did draft and be like, okay, well, my kicker can replace him then because he's he's not going to show up as much as, as as a solid kicker, you know. And you can sit there and just try to try to stack up the board too. But Jeremy, where do you, where do you like to go for your your first overall pick? I know you and I were talking about this. It seems weird because in real life, if you're going dynasty, you'd probably want to go off with the quarterback right off the right off the rip. Um, but I'm pretty sure everything we're doing is is all redraft and everything. So you start off and uh, with basically a, a clean slate. So where do you like to go with that first pick? Yeah, after this weekend and talking to a whole bunch of people, I was 
I was really behind the eight ball just because in my mind I was first thing and I should draft a QB then just keep branching out and just going from there. But after talking to a lot of these people, like I said, from the expo this weekend, I, I would probably start honestly the same with Blake, start with a back and just get somebody strong, then work my way to a receiver foundation, like somebody like Jamar Chase or even like Waddle or, or whoever the situation is that's available. But yeah, I, you can honestly just really wait for, like you mentioned, kickers or even quarterbacks. Like, I would love to have a Joe Burrow as a pick, but am I probably going to get that lucky? I guarantee you not. I will not. But um, looking at it, I I definitely am a lot to learn from it, but I think I can probably branch off pretty quick. But, yeah, I'll probably start with a, a running back or even the wide out to get, get it going here. Yeah, yeah, I think there's there's so many guys too, and it's it, it's tough choosing a running back this year because you're looking around the league. We were talking about this uh, a lot this weekend, just looking around the league and seeing all the running backs that we got, uh, and then also kind of seeing some of the you know the, the question marks that we had. You know what's what's going to happen with Zeke and what's going to happen with Dalvin? Uh, those those kind of yeah. threw some of the wrenches in the plans. You know, for, so I mean, a lot of people might have we were expecting. Dalvin Cook to end up at Miami. That just seemed like the right place for him. It just seemed like that's that's where it's going to yeah. end up. Uh, and we literally just talked about that yesterday. And so it, just, yeah. just looking that now he's over with the Jets, it seemed like that was too far-fetched. Uh, that may throw a little bit of a wrench in the plans. You know, where, where does Brees, Brees Hall fall in, in everything now? And then also looking down at, at Miami, maybe now you can you can think about looking at Raheem Mostert and stuff like, you know, other backs like that around the league uh, and, and other options that maybe wouldn't have been there. Um, but talking about tight ends, I think tight end is a tough position because – you know, Dan and I were talking about this. We've got two tight ends that you really want. That's it's the two tight ends that they're going to secure you points, uh, and then everything after that, you maybe have a good maybe five, five to seven tight ends after that that they're going to be a solid tight end. But the top two, obviously, you want Travis Kelsey and you want Mark Andrews. So where do you fit that tight end, Blake? Uh, if, if you're really trying to get one of those top two tight ends, or are you not too worried about getting one of those two? I'm not too worried because you can uh, – if they fall into your lap, cool. Uh, but there's guys like uh, TJ Hawkinson or, or um, you know, like a, you can go George Kittle. He, he could be there. Um, there's a Darren Waller. If he can stay healthy, he could be there. Um you know, there, there's there's guys there's guys, man. Tight ends not a big position of concern for me, just because it's that one position that one week can it can get you thirty points, the next week it might get you three points. So like, yeah. I'm getting my dudes first, bro. And and look, I'll sit on that waiver wire if I have to, and if somebody messes up and drops a, a big name tight end, I will snatch him up. So. You know, like I know everybody puts their chips all in chips in the into the draft and everything, but man, that waiver wire is where championships are won, bro. They yeah, really yeah, definitely, yeah, definitely. Because you you think definitely. you know you you get everybody in there, but then you start to have injuries, all that kind of stuff, and that's going to be all around the league. So who can have the healthiest team is usually what matters the most, uh, and and that's what's crazy about about fantasy. But like I said, for everyone. Uh, make sure to tune in on August 27th at 10 a.m. over on the Belly Up YouTube page. So go search it. It's Belly Up. I think we're also going to have it on the Belly Up Facebook, all that kind of stuff too. So you can check us out. We're going to have a live draft going. Uh, you can kind of check us out and see what's going on in our draft uh, while watching a little bit of uh, a little bit of football on TV on that day as well. So uh, you'll be able to watch watch all kinds of stuff. You'll have you'll have a full slate, but it'll be a lot of fun. We want you guys to tune in. Like I said before, too, we're gonna we're gonna plan to kind of keep this going throughout the season, kind of keeping tuned in with it, seeing where we're standing, and then also looking uh, kind of around the whole league too, and and seeing uh, what everybody else is doing. And we'll we'll probably have a few guests on as well, kind of talking uh, talking a little bit about fantasy football. And we'll we'll have some of the guys from Belly Up join on with us to kind of talk about our matchups whenever we've got scheduled matchups up against them and all kinds of fun stuff. So make sure to stay tuned for all the season. Uh, for the for the whole season on all of that as well but guys we thank you all so much for watching for listening if you're watching on youtube make sure to hit that subscribe button go ahead and hit that like button as well and if you're listening on apple podcast spotify wherever you listen to podcasts you can give us a five-star review 
That is the greatest way you can help us over there. And make sure to follow us on social media. We've got Facebook X, uh, which was also formerly known as Twitter. That one's going to be confusing <laughs> for me for a while on, on what to call it. Um, but you can go follow us on there, Instagram, all that kind of fun stuff. So go check us out. We love you all so much, and thank you so, so much for your support. And until next time.